Hello, everyone. My name is Kosala Hemachandra. I'm the founder and CEO of My Eto Wallet. And um, for those who are not familiar with My Eto Wallet, we go all the way back to the inception of Ethereum. So a uh, little over six years. So for the past six years, we've been crystal like uh, pro providing you guys with secure, user-friendly, non-custodial, privacy-oriented wallet solution for all Ethereum users. And we basically grew with Ethereum. So we people call us the original or OG Ethereum wallet. And um, now I'm going to be talking about uh, mobile wallet solutions, how mobile wallets will take over the wallet space. So uh, let's first look at what is a wallet. This is, this is a wallet. Literally, this is it. So there's nothing to it. So um, first paper wallet started in, uh, sorry, the, 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 these wallets introduced uh, in 1600s after the paper currency was inter, uh, introduced. Before that, I'm pretty sure people were ca uh, carrying satchels with like valuable items with them. Anyway, so um, let's look at some pros and cons because these pros and cons are actually also applicable to blockchain wallets or uh, private keys. I'll get to that in a second. So some of the, one of the pro is readily available, which means like I have my wallet right here. So it's always readily available. And that also means it can easily be stolen. Like I wouldn't know if someone come behind me and like steal my wallet uh, and lose everything that I have over there. And it's liquid. So credit cards, cash, everything in that is liquid. Also that, that's a con because it's liquid. Uh, again, if it gets stolen, you lose all the cash, you lose cards, everything. And it's private as long as it's with you. And again, the con is it's not insured. If you lose it, you lose it. Um, pro is identity. You can keep your identity in your wallet. Um, uh, for example, to verify to get into a bar, to make sure you are 21, or to drive if you have your driver's license over there. And that also means whoever steals this wallet is able to do identity theft or act like that person is you. So um, yeah, fine. What is an Ethereum wallet? Actually, this is also applicable to a lot of blockchains out there. Uh, it comes down to 32 bytes. Most of the wallets are actually 32 bytes. So that means. 32 random numbers between 0 and 20, 255. So as long as, like, even if you write down, to be honest, you can write down 32 numbers between 0 and 255, and that can be converted into a wallet. But please don't do that, because humans are not capable of coming up with enough randomness. So if you do that, it's most likely, like, it's possible for someone to crack that and then gain steal. And then mnemonic, again, not really a mnemonic. But mnemonic came into the space with the introduction of Bitcoin uh, improvement proposals. So it was BIP32 that actually brought the BIP32, uh, introduced the concept of mnemonic to the world. They basically came up with this concept of, okay, like we can convert entropy to uh, easily readable or easily memorizable words. And then BIP39, uh, Bitcoin Improvement Pro Protocol 39 actually came up with a word set that'll uh, convert the entropy to the mnemonic. And BIP44 later on introduced different paths for different blockchains. And so another advantage of having a mnemonic is one mnemonic can be applicable to any number of blockchains. So Ethereum mnemonic can also be applicable to, for example, let's say, uh, a polygon uh, mnemonic. So that's why a lot of EVM compatible chains or compatible wallets can cross work against each other. So yeah, I've been talking a lot about losing your wallet or probably like you guys are scared of now losing it more than keeping it safe. But there are ways to keep your wallet safe. One of the ways are buy a hardware wallet. And um, some of the advantages are keys reside in a secure hardware element. It runs on an isolated environment. Basically, it's not connected to internet. So as long as you have your hardware wallet with you, whenever you want to sign a transaction, the hardware wallet is where the private keys, the, the keys that I described before, resides. And then the hardware wallet will take care of the actual signing part and then send back the signed transaction so that your keys will be never exposed to the dab that you're using. 
And on top of that, you can add an additional protection via pa pa like a pin code or password. Uh, but like one of the downside is it's expensive. Like hardware wallets go anywhere between $100 to like $600. So it depend on it depends on what kind of wallet you want, what kind like what what appeals to you, what kind of blockchain suppose the wallet has, and all that. Um, and another downside is easily recognizable. So if you have uh, one of these hardware wallets in your bag, and like you, for example, you get checked at the TSA, they know for sure it's a hardware wallet, and that therefore they know you have crypto. So it's super easy for you to become a crypto person in public if someone sees this uh, this wallet these hardware wallets, and it's not readily available. Like for example, if I need a wallet right now, I can't, there's no place to just go and buy the wallet. I have to either order it online and then wait a couple of weeks to, for it to get here. Or like, like you can probably do Amazon, which I don't recommend because you don't know who other vendors are. Um, so there are these problems that reside, like comes, come, uh, come with the hardware wallets. And then, uh, and then we have mobile wallets. Basically, if you look at it, you can see we have the, the, all the good things and we don't have the bad things with the mobile wallets because just because you're carrying a smartphone doesn't mean that you have a crypto wallet. Any person with a smartphone is like, not everyone who has a smartphone is also not like a person who has crypto with them. And then it's free and readily available. You can simply go online, download your wallet, and it's a fully secure, full-blown um, wallet for, for all your transactions. I will get to the point where like, I mentioned isolated environment because you might say, but like, the phone is connected to the internet, so that means there's a way for a malicious app or some kind of malicious person to steal that through internet, to your private keys. So that's where the secure hardware enclave comes in. Almost every single smartphone out there today has this secure enclave built in to the phone. And then this secure enclave is actually a completely separate processor with a completely separate operating system and a completely separate memory. So even if your keys resides in memory, like there are a lot of malicious apps out there that can read your phone's memory and like get all the data from like the memory I'm calling the RAM. Uh, it, and then that's not the case with the secure element because secure element is completely different from existing processor and like your regular processor and your regular memory RAM. And um, operating systems do not have direct access to this secure enclave. It's again, completely separate. So it's, yeah, it's built in a way, even if the system is compromised, the secure enclave will stay secure. And made to secure, like for example, it's, it's made for a different purpose, but we can repurpose that to create a hardware wallet-like situation. So it's made to secure your face unlock information, biometrics, pin code, your Apple Pay, your Google Pay data, and all that. And then you already know these are pretty sensitive information. So all these companies, these really like popular smartphone manufacturers and processor manufacturers, they're taking this secure enclave very seriously. And they want to make sure nothing in this secure enclave leaves the enclave or like get compromised. So that's the most important part. And, um, and some phones actually even use the secure enclave to pro protect the bootloader from tampering. So like secure enclave will create the, keep the hash or signing data for the bootloader. So bootloader is like a prime, it's, that's what boots up your phone and then the operating system kicks in. So even, even the bootloader cannot be compromised because of these security features built into the phone. So yeah, we can easily make the use of the built-in secure enclave on modern phones to protect our private information. It could be a private key, just like you saw before, or um, any other private information that you can think of. And uh, secure enclaves can encrypt and decrypt data within the secure enclave and then give the information back to the user. And the Samsung blockchain phone, some of you are already probably familiar with Samsung, already came up with a like, uh, blockchain phone that already has Ethereum and Bitcoin built in. Basically, they are using this part of the phone to do that. And um, yeah, so 
you can even add on, you can add additional security on top of the existing security built into the uh, enclave, such as biometric or pin code for, before signing the transaction. So what does Mi Wallet do? Mi Wallet is our mobile application. We use this enclave and we take security pretty seriously. So we generate the keys locally and the keys will never ever leave the phone. So keys will always reside in your phone. And then not just one encryption, we use two encryptions to keep your private key safe. So your private key is initially encrypted with the, the password that you choose and then we'll use the secure enclave encryption algorithm to encrypt it again and put it in the enclave. And um, on top of that, we don't use just regular private keys, we use mnemonic to create your wallet. So mnemonics will let us, for example, not just support one blockchain, it'll open up, it'll basically future proof us. We can now support any blockchains in the future and we are ready to support that. And we are already using it to, for example, create E2 wallet addresses. Because E2, when, Ether like in Ether when Ethereum 2 comes out, uh, it'll, the wallet addresses probably will look a little different because they're using a different algorithm to de derive these addresses. And since we already chose to use mnemonic, we can easily use E2, uh, we can derive the E2 addresses using the exact same mnemonic, and it's seamless for the user. The user doesn't even know that this is happening in the background. And um, again, same thing, uh, you can use it with dApps and then app will never expose the underlying private information. So yeah, now let's talk about, I guess, the main topic of the presentation. I actually did uh, an article at Nasdaq about modern finance going mo mobile. So this is a uh, like brief summary of that article, and if, you, if someone's interested in reading the whole article, it's at that link. Um, it's something that I realized, I'd say, two, maybe two and a half years ago. I noticed that modern finance is already going towards mobile. Like Robinhood is a great example. Before Robinhood, everyone used desktops. Like everyone, you had to be a pro and then looking at charts, you had to know exactly what you are doing. You, you had to know all the rules and the uh, laws and SEC and all that before trading. So trading was only applicable to elites back then. And then Robinhood came up with this, the app, and then simplified the whole process for anyone to understand and then feel comfortable about the process. So this led big corporations like Charles Schwab, for example, to increase or like make their mobile apps better for the users and make it easy for the users to understand what trading is or like even give, like I, I call them super apps, like add more functionality to the apps so that they don't have to leave the app. They can use just one app and do everything that that company offers. So for example, Charles Schwab came up with fractional trading, like they cut the fees and um, all in one trading account. So basically they create, added a bank account to your trading profile. So now you can transfer back and forth. This happened because companies like Robinhood revolutionized the whole industry. And um, I actually looked into this survey done by Market Dive. It actually said 85% of the people prefer mobile apps over mobile sites. So if you are like thinking of creating, I guess, um, a mobile site, it's also like take some time to think about, oh, can I actually convert it into an app and give user a better experience? Because you, the moment you decide to create an app, you have access to all these secure parts of the phone that uh, like the, the web will not have access to. So, um, that, yeah, that survey was done by uh, Market Dive. And at the same time, I, I touched a little bit on crypto is the next big thing in uh, modern finance. So crypto will be revolutionizing the crypto uh, finance industry, and that's all of us, that's where we are headed, and all of us, that's where we want to be. And we can learn a lot from what happened in the past and apply that to the future when we create a dApp, create an app, uh, create a wallet, uh, and that's what we should be learning from the past and then apply that to the future. So the best way will be, yes, since everyone loves phones, let's just try to adapt that into our future, like create 
mobile apps, create apps that, super apps that can accomplish all the tasks that you want to accomplish in crypto. Again, yeah, if you want to read the full article, it's, it's at that link. And um, yeah, these are some things that I learned over the past. Uh, wallet is basically the atomic unit of blockchain. Without a wallet, you cannot use the blockchain. Um, and like the, the, there are a like, lot of projects trying to make this whole process seamless, but at the same time, they might be losing some of the security aspect of it because they're not educating their users enough to understand that you have to own the private key for the wallet in order for you to own the funds in that wallet. If that's not the case, then you don't have access to your funds. If that project goes down, that means your funds goes down, period. Like, there's nothing to it. So always make sure you all have access to your wallet. It could be that private key or the mnemonic. Anyway, you, you are the one who must have access to that, not the project, not the company, not the corporation. And um, basically, if the, so b because of that, if the, if the world doesn't have access to a secure wallet, that also means we are not going for the mass adoption. There's no way, to mass, ma no way for the crypto to achieve mass, mass adoption because they don't have access to secure wallets. If they keep using unsecure methods to access and then keep losing funds, that means at some point in time, you know, I know it's, like, it's a big hype right now, but like when the hype dies down, at some point in time, people will, because they are not exposed to secure methods of access, they'll start losing money and then the moment that happens, we'll be stagnant. We can't go up anymore. So in order for that to not happen, we, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to be able to give our users secure methods of access. And here's the good news. 84% of the world already has smartphones. So basically they are carrying a crypto wallet in their hands and they don't even know it. So think about those people. Think about, I'm pretty sure from that 84%, maybe only still 5% of them know about crypto. So that's a huge market out there for you to explore and get to know more about them and then give them access to these methods. And uh, we recently, my ETH wallet recently did a survey on our users and then we realized Mew wallet, our mobile app users, use it more frequently than the Mew web users. So that's a good indication. And we also realize Mi Wallet, our mobile app users, do more transactions than our web users. And, and at the same time, it was a great way to onboard people from third world countries because they don't have access to a laptop or computer. They only have access to a phone, which is a smartphone, and it's pretty secure. And why not onboard them using a phone? So yeah, um, that's basically all I, I wanted to cover with you guys. And um, if you guys want to check out our app, this is the QR code. I'll let it be there for like five seconds, 10 seconds. Um, and I'll probably stay somewhere there for the next 10 minutes if you have any questions. Um, yeah, feel free, explore this space. It's, it's big enough for everyone. Um, healthy competition is always good. Uh, if you are developing an app and want to know security side of things, uh, like send us a message, um, and we'll be more than happy to help you. Yes. What's the difference between MetaMask, uh, Coinbase wallet, and your product? MetaMask, Coinbase wallet, and our products. Yes, good question. MetaMask and Coinbase wallets are extensions that give you access directly to the DAP. Our wallet, Mi Wallet, is think of it as a all-in-one solution to access uh, everything that has to do with Ethereum. Basically, you don't have to navigate to different apps in order to access. And at the same time, it's, uh, we, we are also working with apps to integrate our uh, Mi Wallet application. So you can connect directly to the app just like MetaMask, so you can communicate with them as well. So it's like a one-stop shop. Yes, one-stop shop. Uh, the other big difference is that our keys are in a secure storage versus all the MetaMask and uh, Coinbase wallet keys are in, in the extension in the browser in your computer. We have time for one more quick question for Kasala.
Looking at all the wallets that are available, how do you know or what are some red flags that will like, how you said, choose the right one. If the wallet goes down, then you lose all your funds. What's some red flags that you look for when you have to choose a wallet? Another good question. So um, basically, like if you're downloading it, make sure there are enough reviews and enough downloads, right? If it's a brand new wallet, I'd be really careful about the amount of funds that you put in. And any wallet should take you through that process of creating a mnemonic or creating a private key. And if it's a login, username, and password, that's probably a big no-no for me because that's not non-custodial. So if you want to control the funds, you need to have access to your keys.